So we pass the controls over to you, uh, Dominic, and you can start your presentations. And I think we'll um, hold this to the end if that works for people. Um, if possible to do questions during the presentation, we'll, we'll attempt that, but often we'll get feedback and a number of other uh, challenges. So we'll set this up where we hold questions to the end of each of the presentations from before we proceed, would you have getting logged on? I will now um, control to you, Dominic. I'm here. So I just need to get out of yours and into mine. Yeah, the, um, no longer viewing the presenter's shared content. Return to sharing. Wait one second. I'm just giving you the controls now. Ah, okay. That'd be scary giving me the controls. <laughs> I'll take it in an hour. Okay. <laughs> Everybody see the uh, presentation screen? You can I guess just hit uh, hit a button or something. No. No, I'm seeing your screen right now, Dominic. You need to share my desktop. Share desktop screen. Oh, you do. I'll be seeing it now. Yep, looks good. All right. Well, thanks to uh, John and Mary for inviting us today, and, and it's an exciting time, I think, for uh, all the work that's going into climate change adaptation. And LCCs have been doing this for a number of years now, and also the Forest Service and what they've been doing with their climate scorecard and the early adopter forest. And we've been partnering on some of those projects as well. And I think the way this is going to go today is we're going to give you a, a roughly about a 40-minute presentation. And it'll be PowerPoint-driven, showing some examples and some tools of uh, what we've been using in our adaptation planning that we hope will live and generate some discussion around whether there's uh, interest in applying some of these tools in a planning context on the National Forest and with the LCCs, and we'll be showing some examples of how we've been doing this in some of our project locations. It's going to be a split presentation um, to start off with some of we've been doing on conservation blueprints. Then I'm going to hand it off to Marnie, and she's going to be talking about some uh, processes that uh, she's been running with local communities to get them interested in planning for climate change um, was really a stakeholder-driven process. So that is the backdrop. I'm going to um, just kind of go through some steps that we've been taking in approaching our climate uh, adaptation objectives. And the work we do here at GEOS Institute um, is focused on a vision that we are promoting, which is preparing communities for climate change, also preparing uh, uh, ecosystems so that they can be resilient and function in the presence of climate change. And with that, with that in mind, we're hoping that that will generate a high quality of life uh, for uh, communities that are uh, dealing with, increasingly dealing with climate change. So that's kind of our overall approach of how we see the world through the lens of climate change. As John mentioned in his preface um, remarks, our mission really is to use science to help people predict, reduce, and prepare for climate change. The map that you see in front of you in the different shades of color are places where we have projects on the ground working on different uh, processes for preparing ecosystems or communities for climate change. And areas in purple are what we're calling conservation blueprints, and I'll say a, a word or two about that in a minute. And areas in yellow are where we're doing stakeholder-driven processes, and Marnie's going to be talking about that. And uh, the insert there, the Pacific Coastal Rainforest Region, is a case study that I will be talking about where we are implementing a blueprint project that we've done in collaboration with the North Pacific LCC, the Forest Service, and a bunch of other folks that have helped us through that process. First thing is 
I mentioned these two different processes, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about distinguishing the two, and then you'll have examples from each of them that you'll see in the presentation. On the left of the screen is our climate-wise process, where in the communities we present information on climate projections, and then uh, we have the stakeholders design their community preparation plans. And Mark's going to be talking about that in her part of the presentation. Right of the screen are the conservation blueprints that are driven by objectives that either um, land managers are interested in, conservation groups, sometimes foundations and funders are interested in, you know, tell us whether or not the uh, way we're approaching conservation in the region is, is going to be robust to climate change. So it has more of an ecosystem focus. Ideally, you want to bring both of the processes together, and we're trying to work through some of that now. Um, and the presentations are going to be, uh, they're going to come across as, as being different presentations. But, you know, ideally, we're trying to bring the two of these tools together. But we're seeing them as separate uh, processes and how we present it uh, today on the call. Okay, so the first one, the Pacific Coastal Rainforest Blueprint. The region of interest here overlaps almost entirely with the North Pacific LCC, but it's uh, looking mostly at temperate rainforest communities. And with this region, because of its global accolades from a biodiversity standpoint, the Tongass and the Great Bear Rainforest are two of only four areas of the world that are still relatively intact from a temperate rainforest standpoint. You all have exceptional levels of old growth temperate rainforest, so highest concentrations in the world. Um, incredible salmon runs that live in this region can attest to the world class salmon runs on the Tongass and the Great Bear rainforest. And we've got a very carbon dense, carbon rich forest, some of the most carbon dense ecosystems on the planet. So there are no shortages of biodiversity reasons for choosing this area, which is why we are focused on it. And it was also a good extension for the book that I did on temperate and boreal rainforest of the world because we wanted to see potentially how this region would respond to climate change, compare the region's biodiversity for those effects. Okay, the first thing that we did is we wanted to know how things were trending from a temperature standpoint. And these are three uh, general circulation models that you see on the screen for the A2A emissions scenario looking out uh, forward in time to 2080. I want to point out that all the colors on the screen here are increasing temperature, even though the blue is generally associated with cooling. Uh, that is an increase in temperature. And you can see the three models generally show an increase in temperature out to 2080 of anywhere from 2 to 6 degrees centigrade, and the degree of that increase differs depending on the model and where you are regionally. You can see the interior of Alaska really heats up relative to regions down south and the differences across the models, but they're all trending in the same direction of the temperatures over the, uh, the course of the remaining century. So we get the precipitation. Using the same models, you could see that a couple of things are going on here. All models show an increase in precipitation. This is annual precipitation, um, an increase throughout the northern part of the region. And then to one model here, the Hadley model is because it shows a reduction in precipitation. For the other two models that are still showing increases, we kind of have a wet spot here on the Olympic Peninsula in terms of how that's likely to a rain. But basically, um, you've got some model disagreement here. And um, even though the precipitation is increasing to the north, we've got some disagreements down in the south. And we're going to be talking about uh, later on in the presentation how you deal with these kinds of disagreements. And it gets down to assessing model uncertainty. And so we have approached this in all the modeling that you're going to see on the uh, call today. We have our models all overlapping and showing us our trends are heading in the same direction. We've got higher degrees of certainty 
And conversely, where we have less overlap, we have higher degrees of uncertainty. So you're going to be hearing that quite a bit in the call today in terms of how you plan for these differences in degrees of uncertainty from a resources perspective. Well, getting down into the nuts and bolts, we had a lot of partners working with us on the Pacific Coastal uh, Blueprint. You can see them listed on the screen there. And to do this part of the project, we got funding from the Yale School of Forestry. They put together an adaptation framework that was done in collaboration with 13 scientists that were convened by the school with a lot of expertise in some of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. A variety of scientists from agencies and academia and the private sector. When the framework was produced, there were six case studies that were funded in 2011 to test the framework. And we got one of the grants, and we wanted to apply the Yale framework to the Pacific Coastal Blueprint. To get information on what that framework looks like at a gateway that's listed on your screen. And if you don't see it, maybe you'll see it again at the end of the presentation where you can get information on, on the process. So here's what the process looks like. Um, the vertical axis are six objectives that go into a planning toolkit for adaptation. Across the top of the screen are different scales of analysis that you can all be interested in terms of how you apply it uh, to your planning. So we've got landscape level, which is the courses uh, resolution. Then we've got ecosystems, which are kind of the plant cover types. And then we've got focal species, which roughly um, translate to the surrogate species process that Fish and Wildlife Service is working on uh, presently. So our objectives range from protecting current biodiversity to projecting forward in terms of biodiversity patterns in a changing climate, looking at ecological processes, maintaining connectivity, protecting the climate refugia, and then protecting the enduring stage. And by the enduring stage, we mean the landscape uh, facets that are not likely to change from climate. So things like slope and elevation, soil types, those are the enduring stages. And so we then started filling in our boxes in terms of what we could provide using the data sets that we're assembling for the Pacific Coastal Blueprint. And most of the box filled uh, for the project, you can see a couple of them we weren't able to address because of either data uh, deficiencies or we didn't have the funding to do a uh, uh, portion of the matrix. But this is something that, um, if we were to implement this uh, anywhere in the country, we would take out this matrix and we would start filling in the boxes in terms of what kind of data sets and tools are out there for putting together this kind of a blueprint. And that's what we did for at least the Pacific Coastal Rainforest. And you're going to see how we apply those next series of slides. I'll go back to our um, study area. We have three main questions that we're looking at that corresponded to the uh, objectives that you saw in the previous slide that related to the uh, Yale framework. You know, the one being how might rainforest communities and focal species shift in response to climate change? Similar question related to key ecosystem processes, and then kind of landscape features might act as refugia, and then how to apply this from a planning standpoint. So that's what we were looking at um, during this process, and that's what you're going to see some examples of for at least this part of the presentation. Okay, the thing that comes to mind in any kind of adaptation planning is what kind of scale analysis are you looking at? And, and we took the approach of moving up and down the spatial and temporal hierarchy, starting at a regional level, going up 23 degrees of latitude, then looking at rainforest zones. You can kind of see these zones here that differ bioclimatically throughout the region. Then moving into ecosystems, both the current and projected levels, looking at the focal species, both current and projected, and then using that information to address issues like refugia, connectivity, and how ecosystem processes might change with climate. The uh, 
the course level of analysis, the landscape level, and trying to uh, figure out how you put together landscape refugia in a changing climate. We took a look at the MC1 um, model that was developed by the PNW Research Station. It's a dynamic vegetation model. A lot of factors go into it. It's used for looking across the whole rainforest assemblage. And what you see on the screen there are areas in dark green are where we have agreement among the three models that those areas are going to be climatically stable and therefore maintain their vegetation. The in black are where we have agreement among the three models going to be unstable and therefore less likely to maintain their vegetation communities, and then you've got different levels of uncertainty in the other shadings. Looking for model agreement among three general cir circulation models, as mentioned in, the, um, in the, uh, the continuum that you see here, and we're using that to define our refugia. So areas in dark green, which are going to remain relatively stable, could be looked at as refugia at a landscape level. Those in black, which are stable, um, be something you wouldn't want to think about in terms of refugia necessarily. The level of analysis would be to look for landscape connectivity. And there are a lot of different ways that you can approach connectivity at this scale. What we did is we took our stable areas that you saw the last slide, and we plot them along elevation gradients. So areas that you see that are in the orange have high climatic stability at lower elevations. In red, we've got high climatic stability at moderate elevations. And then purple is high climatic stability at high elevations. And so at course level, what you see from this is good elevation representation of the, the state areas in the northern part of the region and poor elevation representation of the stable areas in the southern part of the region. So you're going to have more connectivity challenges down here, and you're going to have more connectivity opportunities up here if you're trying to connect your stable areas. We can take a zoom in to the MC1 results looking at design ecosystem refugia. So we're going at a, a, a finer scale here. And again, looking at this uh, gradient of high climatic stability and model agreement being green, low climatic stability and model agreement being in the wine color, and you get a good cross section here of, of at least the subpolar portion of the region in terms of its relative stability. And then you kind of zoom in further and look at how the different land cover types are likely to shift over time under the three different models that we looked at compared to the baseline. So patterns emerge here. Um, firstly, if you look at at least the Hadley model, the Kenai Peninsula is showing a shift from cool mixed forest. Uh, I'm sorry, it's showing a mix from this baseline needle leaf forest to more of a cool mixed forest type. Uh, BC coastal areas also go increasingly to deciduous uh, woodlands and away from needle leaf uh, forest. So that's a concern from a management standpoint in terms of how do you manage these areas when you're going to get the potential for this kind of uh, vegetation shift related to the climate uh, change. The southern terminus down by the redwood zone, it gets even more dramatic. Uh, because things look like they may dry out more in the southern portion. So again, looking at the course picture, the stable areas is in, in dark green and the unstable is in the kind of wine color, and then zooming into the cover types. I just jumped ahead. Hang on a second. Zooming the cover types. Basically what's going on here, more the, sub, the climate is becoming more suitable for the subtropical types, at the expense of coast redwood. So it's a thing if you're trying to maintain redwood. What we wanted to do is we wanted to look at what would be a good connectivity strategy for redwood in a changing climate. And it turns out that redwood loses most of its climatic niche by 2080. We're already seeing 
the loss of fog in the redwood zone. Over the last two or three decades, there's been a measurable decline in fog. When you project out the climate models, the niche of redwood really declines dramatically. And so one way to maintain redwood is to connect is that are going to maintain their climate at a micro level. And you kind of see those areas in blue. These are intact forests that are likely to hang on to their climate. The areas in green that you see here are intact, um, they are fragmented forests that are likely to maintain their climate. So the thing here is to connect these areas so that you've got some movement of redwood assemblages into climatically suitable areas as the climate niche uh, contracts. So it's a way to look at a resilient strategy for connectivity for this particular species. Okay, now I'm going to deal with the focal species results. We've been mainly talking about landscapes and ecosystems, so we're going to zoom in now and look at focal species. This might have some application to to the planning rule that the Forest Service is looking at and also to the surrogate species that Fish and Wildlife Service is interested in. And we just kind of, we looked at what was our criteria for selection. First, we wanted to choose some uh, conifers of commercial importance. Range overlaps with that of the coastal rainforest. And you can see that we list eight different commercial conifers here. We also took a look at two lichens that are important for deer forage and nutrient cycling, nitrogen fixation, and so any, uh, any uh, perceived loss in those species could have rippling effects, affect the species in, in the rainforest community. We are interested in the species of cultural importance, the Sitka Hill deer, which is mostly southeast Alaska, and two threatened bird species that are sensitive to forest fragmentation. In addition, we wanted to see how climate change might impact them as well. Okay, so to look at the focal species, we first wanted to construct their species distributions. And so what we did is we worked with researchers throughout the region who provided us with point data sets on locations for the focal species of interest. We then used a max and presence only model to generate the predicted species distributions based on the known locations. We wanted to look at the predicted range for those species. And then we um, loaded up the climate data sets on those locations so that we had a correlation between the location of the species and the climatic variables they were associated with. So this allows us to construct the climate envelope for current conditions for those species to project forward. We project, projected distributions for those species under three general circulation models, two emissions scenarios. We did a model accuracy test that you can see, and projected that at a resolution of a kilometer squared. So this is you're going to be seeing now in the species distribution uh, results that are in the slides that follow. Okay, just recalling for the moment how we're dealing with model uncertainty. The sweet spot is when we get all the models that are trending in the same direction and they have different degrees of uncertainty depending on whether we have two models overlapping or no overlap. I'm just going to show one graphic illustration and then a table of results. This is our results for Grand Fur. Here is the predicted current distribution for Grand Fur based on the Maxent model. And you can kind of see the two time periods, the two emission scenarios. And so in this case, the um, area in dark red are where we have agreement among the three models that we're going to see a, a loss of the climate niche for Grand Fur. And, and you kind of project into 2080 in these two emission scenarios show extensive climate niche loss for that species. And, um, conversely, the dark blue shows some potential for a gain in climate niche, and the dark green showing persistence of species in a changing climate. Now you put together all the focal species, uh, tree species results, and you get a, a pattern that emerges. 
the conifer species show a decline of the climate niche in the southern extent, and they show a converse uh, increase in the niche gain in the northern and high um, uh, or elevation. So northern latitudes, high elevations get a gain. Southern latitudes see a loss of the niche. And then you've got persistence in other areas. This is followed quite nicely with some of the other species we looked at. Again, a uh, reduction in the climate niche um, in the southern range, and gain in the climate niche in higher elevations and higher latitudes. Okay, a couple of slides I'll show, and then we'll get to some conclusions. Our, we all looked at how climate change might influence some of the key ecosystem processes that you all are concerned about. Uh, mostly, uh, most of which includes fire. And the photo was quite interesting because what it shows is in the dark brown, an increase in biomass consumed by fire. See how it differs across the region. That really a problem in the northern latitudes. And depending on which model you use, the Hadley again was the dry model. You get more fire likely in the region. If you go to a wet model, you get less. It's still you know you pick up some in here, but you get a lot less than you get under this model. In terms of how you manage for this, it depends on whether you're a risk taker and manage for you know the extreme event or you want to uh, look at a precautionary approach and just kind of do a wait and see game and a management and monitoring to see if the uh, trend is in this direction. And the reason I point this out is it's important in the coastal rainforest regions because by design, they are wet places with dense vegetation and a thinning model in these coastal rainforests might not work. And so it depends on where you want to, to be on this uh, line of either risk taker or precautionary approach in terms of what you do with the management uh, with these results. And likewise, on the carbon side, I know carbon is a big concern for um, the Forest Service at this point, looking at how to manage carbon with a new plan rule and you know, projecting forward to 2075. If you use the Hadley model, because you get more funding in the system, you're going to be losing more carbon. And then if you look at the Cicero model, you get less carbon loss due to fire. But it's just something to think about in terms of how you manage your carbon resource, climate change in the mix, and we can talk a little bit later on about some tools for that from a management standpoint. Okay, so the take-home messages in terms of the Pacific Coastal Rainforest Blueprint, uh, we're seeing all the models basically telling us the region is going to heat up by 2080. And the extent of that heating depends on where you are in the region and which emission scenario um, really um, is the driving factor involved. Uh, we've got changes in precipitation, but degrees of uncertainty. Remember the Hadley model showing drying in the southern latitudes and the other models not showing that. But just increase in precipitation to the north. One thing we didn't talk about, which is what we're seeing if you kind of look further into these models, are wet winters and drier summers occurring uh, in portions of the region. The wildest changes in climate, the likely changes to vegetation are rainforests begin to contract to the seasonal zone in the Olympics. So we get a lot of loss of the climate niche in the southern latitudes where woods begin to become more suited to the climate than the conifers do in the south. We get some replacement of the niche moving in the climate niche moving in the direction of deciduous trees in the north latitudes over conifers. You saw that in the example I gave you of the mid coastal British Columbia slide. Uh, look at the climate niche of the focal conifer species, like the vegetation, in the south with gains in latitude and elevation. And so put together a, a robust conservation strategy if your objective is to, main bio, to maintain biodiversity in this globally significant region, you can maintain connectivity. And we look at some examples of elevation and connecting the stable areas along elevation gradients. Reduce the stressors on the system. For instance, both Merlet and the Spotted Owl are fragmentation 
sensitive species and you want to have a connected landscape to enable those species to move around as the climate niche shifts on them. Protect fugia, which would be intact areas in the case of the redwoods and connecting those to stable areas and then doing some restoration in the fred uh, uh, system. And the key challenge you all have is balancing the risk-taking versus the precautionary approach. I mean, we want to make sure that we're on top of this and we're not waiting forever on this, and this is where adaptive management comes in. We also want to make sure that we don't make the situation worse in the long run. So that becomes a balancing act and a challenge, I'm sure, for all of you. So the last I'll say before I turn it over to Marnie, if the analyses that we presented here and you kind of put this matrix together of what you all are doing with your revisions and your climate scorecard, your vulnerability assessments, and the science priorities, you begin to get a, a nice little um, matrix of how this process can really help with planning. And so we've got examples that I provided of focal species that could be used in forest planning, uh, revisions and vulnerability assessments. You could also use the materials we provided for uh, looking at ecosystem trajectories, refugia and connectivity, how fire and carbon are likely to change, what this means for T and E species, and planning at broader scale. So, you know, we're looking to, to work with the agencies on this, and you'll hear more from this uh, on this uh, from Marnie and her talk, but I just wanted to, to kind of put this up here to see what could potentially be in your toolbox uh, using this kind of an approach. So that includes my part of it. Marnie is going to talk a little bit about what happens on the ground, and then we can open it up uh, for some from some chatting. Great. Thank you. So I showed you how we start to identify some important climate refugia and potential linkages, and obviously there's all sorts of other work being done on that as well. Um, something that becomes apparent is that these important areas um, that become increasingly important with climate change don't necessarily align with protected area boundaries or even with public lands. And oftentimes, refugia and linkages will fall on private lands or even on multiple use lands. And so while most agencies are planning adaptation within their jurisdictional boundaries, um, while most agencies are planning uh, adaptation within their jurisdictional boundaries, we really need to start increasing uh, collaboration and coordination across all boundaries. And obviously the LCC is working to link natural resource management across larger geographic areas, but even so integration is still the exception. Um, rather than the rule. So talk about how we can take these broad scale assessments and start to apply them at the local level. Oh, thank you. And as we do this, we need to be thinking about how to coordinate adaptation strategies and also timing across land ownership. The need for working across land ownership has been extensively documented. It comes up in all sorts of planning documents. It comes up in every, every meeting I attend um, in application conferences. And so the need for working across land ownership is well established, yet most management and most adaptation planning is still carried out within specific jurisdictional boundaries rather than across the larger landscapes, um, across stakeholders, and across communities. As they point in the national Fish, Wildlife, and Plants Adaptation Strategy, uh, which I'm showing you some quotes from that here. Um, private lands are already important for natural systems and will become increasingly important as climate change progresses. And Department of Interior's Climate Change Response Plan, uh, they call for integrated planning and for people working together. In 2004, there was even an executive order calling for local participation and federal decision making. So again, the need for working across boundaries is not new, and it's something that the LCCs especially are working towards, but currently we have a disconnect between the need and adap actual adaptation planning on the ground. I want to introduce you to a program that we developed in collaboration with the Climate Leadership Initiative out of the University of Oregon. And this map shows you how we've been working. We have the blueprints, which again are in blue on this map. Um, and we have some 
on with these community-driven processes uh, we call climate-wise in both purple and in yellow on the map. And we work with local communities to integrate their planning across the watershed, across a county, or across a group of counties. And the counties where we've worked, there have extensive amounts of ex there are extensive amounts of public lands. And we see such a process as climate wise or something similar, another way to pull in the community adopted more widely with core planning across both public and private lands. So our process, uh, climate wise again is a community driven process. That means that we convene the leaders and the experts to plan for climate change, but we don't dictate what those plans might look like. Uh, the community identifies what their priorities are and how they want to plan for them. And basically, we bring them a lot of the tools that they need to do that. Climate-wise process, we bring together different sectors of community to plan for climate change in a coordinated manner. And the sectors fall into five categories. Um, so for economic systems, we would have things like agriculture, forestry, local business, and tourism. And in built systems, we would have things like roads, buildings, and water and energy infrastructure. Culture systems include Native American cultural resources and traditions, as well as immigrant communities. And natural systems cover terrestrial, aquatic, and intertidal systems. Human systems include human health, social services, emergency preparedness, and safety. So then our process look something like this. And, um, and this very familiar. What we're seeing is a real convergence on climate change planning. Um, so the groups that are trying to figure out how they might plan that resources, either uh, human resources or natural resources for climate change, are following very similar steps to this. And we start step one, which is to build strong local partnerships, uh, bring groups together in a community to start talking about planning in a coordinated manner rather than in the individual sectors that they use the planning in. Step two involves a, basically a climate science review. So what is the latest science? What is it telling us? What are the trends? Um, what is the uncertainty? And also where applicable collecting e traditional ecological knowledge to enhance that science review. That builds a common understanding about the local impacts of climate change that the community then can use as the basis of their adaptation planning. Step three consists of a series of vulnerability assessments to identify where the community is most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And with familiar framing of sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity as the key components of vulnerability. And we really found that this framing is very effective across the different sectors. It's really easy for people to understand the different components of vulnerability and to pull those together to look um, more deeply at the sectors that they're interested in. Some of the things, and these are just some examples, they really vary community to community um, of what we, some of the things that we look at include stability, health and safety among low income populations, plain development, escape and emergencies, uh, wildlife populations, and ecosystem services. And three is carried out largely within individual sectors. Step four is important that we carry out across the different sectors, and this is where integration really starts to happen. We build adaptation strategies that are co-beneficial across the sectors and intended to prepare each sector for climate change without exacerbating climate change impacts to the other sectors. The strategies are coordinated across landscapes and across timeframes. In step five, we look for cost sharing and partnership opportunities, and because the strategies are co-beneficial, there are all sorts of opportunities for new collaborations, for joint funding, or groups that historically have worked separately, but now they might benefit from working together. And six, um, implement, implementation step, and this is basically a higher talk in itself of how do you implement uh, action on the ground. And one of the ways that we've been successful at moving things towards implementation more quickly is to form a committee very early in the process that always stays focused on this step and make sure that all of the other steps are leading directly to this um, and that everything is in place by the time this process is, is ready to go. And step seven includes monitoring and reassessing adaptation when new science or data become available. Also 
just so that we can determine how effective new strategies are. Many of these adaptation strategies haven't been well documented in the past, and we want to know if they're working. And we'll need to know when we might need to change course. And point out is that this um, looks very familiar to, um, very similar to the adaptive management cycle that the Forest Service is using, and many of the steps are the same in the orders basically occur in the same the same process. So, um, so there, the climate process could be easily applied in a forest service or other agency setting to bring local leaders and stakeholders into their planning. What we're really working to avoid with ClimateWise is the sector-specific responses to climate change. Uh, managers and decision makers within a sector realize the threat of climate change. They naturally kind of move towards some of the more traditional approaches that have been used over the past century. And these include things like building new dams to provide water supply and flood protection, and building seawalls sea to protect coastal structures. And these approaches of the past have created the environmental conflicts that we have today. And by applying the same approaches in response to climate change, we could be increasing conflict for future generations to deal with. Uh, and what we're doing with the climate-wise process is trying to find a better approach than that. We want a modern and ecologically sound approach that is synergistic rather than divisive. In addition to some of those outdated management structures of the past century, we're also concerned that when individual sectors start to plan for climate change, plan for respond to climate change, they'll do so in new ways that also could create new conflicts. So the expansion of renewable energy without landscape level planning for its placement, um, the thin of forests to reduce wildfire risk, and extension of agricultural lands as yields decline with climate change. Always the communities are likely to respond to climate change, but these responses need to be coordinated in a way um, that, that work within the overall goals and priorities across the landscape of the overall community. And what we found by having a community-wide um, community process like ClimateWise is that when groups together to plan, they have very different strategies than they're only thinking about impacts to their individual sector. And so when we work with city and county planners, water managers, emergency response professionals, elected leaders, and natural resource managers all together, the overwhelming solution to a variety of issues with water and flooding is to restore watersheds. And here I have an example of restoration of the Little Butte Creek. Here you can see um, the creek was straightened in the 1940s, and where just within the last year or so, meander has been added back into the original, um, to, the, to the creek. And when the channel was straightened, the water began to flow more quickly, and it would scour the gravel and degrade fish habitat. <clears throat> and there was also a loss of floodplain flood plain function. So with the restoration of the original meander, we gain a variety of benefits to diverse sectors of the community. And we also prepare for climate change by holding more water in the system, even as snow runoff likely to start occurring more quickly in the early spring. And those held longer when we have um, restoration. So some of the benefits of a process like this would, inc would include groundwater recharge, increasing groundwater recharge as that water stays longer in important areas for recharge. Um, downstream flood abatement, um, again the water staying longer so you get more late summer flows, restored aquatic habitat, and improved water quality. This recommendation comes up very high when we work in these mixed groups. And um, another benefit of collaborative planning has been the development of strategies that seem to be a little bit more bold and more innovative um, when they're made in mixed groups than when they're developed within individual sectors. So we that within an agency or a department, managers develop strategies that work within our current limiting policies, culture, and regulations. But they start to work with people from different sectors. They start to think outside those limitations quite a bit more. And I think it might be because they're working directly with the folks that might be able to help change some of that policy and culture if, as a community, they decide that that's important. 
One strategy has been the reintroduction of beavers throughout western watersheds um, for the same benefits that I mentioned of, with the Little Beaver Creek restoration process, um, including increased flood water storage, um, so to improve, improve groundwater safety for um, development, groundwater recharge, and then longer late summer flows. And when we worked in the Klamath Basin, recommendations to extend a program that's called Walking Wetlands, where agricultural lands are rotated with wetlands to increase the productivity of agricultural lands while also providing important wild habitat. Kind of a similar program that's been expanding in Northern California where ranchers have partnered with uh, Point Reyes Bird Observatory and Audubon to change their grazing patterns across hundreds of thousands of acres. And in response to this collaboration, um, streams that have been intermittent for decades are now becoming perennial again, and cattle production actually has increased. How to get a community on the same page when you're planning for a controversial topic like climate change? And the way that we've been doing this is to focus on local values. Um, we worked in Missoula County, and we held a workshop with over 100 local leaders and experts started by identifying what the community valued in their daily lives and in their workplace, what brought people to the region and also what makes them want to stay there. We found that people in Missoula County did water, outdoor recreation, fish and wildlife, compassionate communities, and a high quality of life. And they worked to develop adaptation strategies in the workshops that we held. They quickly realized that their future was closely tied to management on public lands and, tri and also on tribal lands, and that coordination was vital to the safety of, of the residents and also to their quality of life. Talks between the county and the Forest Service have begun. They'll need to closely coordinate their plan for adaptation if they want to maintain the Missoula community values that were identified as important. I really want to thank everyone for joining us today and for um, hearing our work. And we would like to invite you to contact us about the Blueprints process or about the ClimateWise program. And we would really like to increase our reach and to help groups prepare for climate change in a more integrated manner, especially uh, the LCCs and the early adopter forests. And up here you have some links to our reports. Um, we've got the Blueprint links and the ClimateWise links, and then also the Yale Get Gateway, which has um, information from Pacific Northwest Blueprint process. And I think we probably have some time for questions. John, over to you. I don't know how you want to do the, the K on this. We did almost everybody that, uh, that can. So if anybody has any questions, why don't you just, uh, let's just uh, go ahead and jump in. And if we have feedback, we can put people back on mute. Right now, everybody is unmuted. And uh, if anybody has a question or a comment, feel free to um, to jump in right now. Keep in with a quick one. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Great. Don Gallo from the Wilderness Society. Uh, great presentation. Thank you both. Um, Dominic, a question to you um, regarding the site of managing uh, um, managers balancing the risk taking with the precautionary approach. Um, I'm wondering what uh, you thought much about doing this on a geographic uh, sense. In other words, trying to maybe designate really large landscapes um, that we're going to say, okay, let's let's take this whole landscape that's contiguous and connected and kind of use the philosophy of the primary approach and then have another landscape somewhere else that's kind of representing the same sorts of values and take that as kind of a risk-taking area. Um, a way of doing it rather than trying to manage both simultaneously at the same uh, geographic basis. Yeah, great question. Uh, thanks. And I think, you know, from a theoretical standpoint, if you look at the results that we presented, you would uh, re inclusion based on biodiversity concerns that the northern latitudes are most likely to maintain their extant biodiversity, albeit with the changes noted. And northern latitude rainforests are also the most relatively intact. And so if you look at the 
the uh, temperate rainforest across the 23 degrees of latitude, you could conclude that you know, really the northern uh, pieces that are going to act at refugia on a big scale, but you can do the the region, the sub-regional zoom in, and you can look for those stable uh, areas and manage them using similar uh, principles, but you wouldn't have the large blocks like you do in the northern latitudes. And I think as you get further south to the driest systems, that's where you can start to, to look at interplay between risk management and cautionary approach. The only thing that concerns me is what sort of risk taking uh, you would be applying down in the southern uh, portion. And for instance, if you were to use a thing model in the portion of the, of the rainforest region, I mean, a lot of reasons for thinning forest, and you can look at it from the standpoint of improving the structural uh, characteristics of a plantation, and that would be uh, ecologically appropriate. But if you're thinking about thinning that region from a fire standpoint, we could get into the trade-offs between risk management and precautionary approach because those systems by design are very dense and to apply a different kind of management regime on them could produce a novel ecosystem type. So it really comes down to you know, what do we mean by the risks and how do we balance that with the other issues that uh, the agencies are concerned about. Uh, when looking at this issue through the lens of biodiversity, and uh, climate change. So I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I have a, uh, this is Joel Gerwine from the California State Coastal Conservancy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my question, I, I'm working with a group of folks up in the Humboldt Bay area on regional um, vacation planning. And I noticed uh, the, the areas that you had um, picked for regional planning varied quite a bit in scale. You were talking about the town of Missoula, but you also had counties as kind of the smallest areas that I saw in, uh, in the West Coast that you showed. So I wonder if you would just say something about what an appropriate scale is uh, for this kind of regional adaptation and planning. Um, yeah, so it really varies. I mean, it's been so um, regionally different. Um, I think it depends on how diverse of a community you have so, and also how spread out of a community you have. Um, in some, so we worked in the Klamath Basin, which turned out to be a very large geographic area to work in, and it was difficult then to pull the communities together because they were so spread out. Um, so I think we would have benefited from maybe doing an upper basin and a lower basin process. Uh, then when we worked in in um, San Luis Obispo County, really felt like we could have actually pulled a couple more counties into that process because they were all with similar issues. Uh, so if you have, you know, a lot of similar coastal habitats that are going to have similar adaptation strategies to develop, um, and and if the communities are are mostly uh, compatible in the way that they want to plan for this, then I think you could do a lot area. So it really depends. Thanks. I have a question. This is uh, Lynn Helbrecht from um, Washington and Wildlife. And for Dominic, uh, you talked a lot about the uncertainty in the climate models, and I'm curious about the uncertainty in the vegetation models. Yeah, a great question. And I don't know if you are aware of the uh, work that's going into MC1 at this point. There's some truthing that is going into it now and trying to get that model to behave more with what we see on the ground. So it does introduce some uncertainty with MC1 to the model's performance. But I think by and large, people are a good predictive model. Model, I'm picking up some background noise, so to mute that background noise uh, go away. So I think, you know, that's one issue. The other issue is, um, you know, really kind of a course analysis. So as you know, you're not going to stay on a pixel anywhere in the region and say, okay, this is temperate deciduous or this is broadleaf needle, needle leaf vegetation, whatever. So it's not meant for that kind of application. So the, the closer the zoom in, I would say, the greater the degree of uncertainty. So it's overall uses to just kind of show the trends and some things to uh, take into consideration when planning at a course scale. So 
I would feel a lot more comfortable with using it at a core scale and then backing it up with uh, more site-specific analysis. Questions for Dominic or Marnie? Get to your screen because that, um, the contact information for both of them at GEOS, and I want to thank both Dominic and Marty for joining us today and all of you that participated. We had a great turnout today. A lot of people, and I think it was a successful conference. So we've recorded this. It will be available on our website and probably on the GEOS website as well. If you have any questions or comments, contact Dominic, Marnie, or myself here in Olympia, and um, we look forward to presenting to you again at a future webinar. With that, close the webinar down, and uh, thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us.